Good evening and welcome to Evening Prayer for Thursday, September the 17th. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let my prayer rise before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Joyous light of glory of the immortal Father, heavenly, holy, blessed Jesus Christ, we have come to the setting of the sun and we look to the evening light. We sing to God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are worthy of being praised with pure voices forever. O Son of God, O giver of life, the universe proclaims your glory. The Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night and peace at the last. Amen. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praise to your name, O Most High, to herald your love in the morning, your truth at the close of the day. Praise to you, O Christ. O come, let us worship him. Lord Jesus, stay with us, for the evening is at hand and the day is past. Be our constant companion on the way. Kindle our hearts and awaken hope among us that we may recognize you as you are revealed in the scriptures and in the breaking of the bread. Grant this for your name's sake. Amen. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchman for the morning, more than watchman for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption, and he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Our New Testament reading today is from Colossians chapter 4. Masters, treat your slaves justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us, that God may open to us a door for the word, to declare the mystery of Christ, on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Tychicus will tell you all about my activities. He is a beloved brother and the faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. And with him Onesimus, our faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you. They will tell you of everything that has taken place here. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you, and Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, concerning whom you have received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. And Jesus, who is called Justice. These are, only men, these are the only men of the circumcision among my fellow workers for the kingdom of God, and they have been a comfort to me. Epiphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus, greets you, always struggling on your behalf in his prayers, that you may stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. For I bear him witness that he has worked hard for you and for those in Laodicea and in Hierapolis. Luke, the beloved physician, greets you, as does Demas. Give my greetings to the brothers at Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house. And when this letter has been read among you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans, and see that you also read the letter from Laodicea, and say to Archippus, see that you fulfill the ministry you have received in the Lord. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. Our Book of Concord reading today is a continuation of Article 5 on love and fulfilling the law, beginning in paragraph 192. From these statements, we hope that it is clear both what faith is and that we are justified, reconciled, and regenerated through faith. We are compelled to hold on to these teachings because we want to teach the righteousness of the gospel, not the righteousness of the law. For those who teach that we are justified by love teach the righteousness of the law. They do not teach us in justification to trust in Christ as mediator. These things are also clear. We overcome the terrors of sin and death, not through love, but through faith. For we cannot set up our love and fulfilling of the law against God's wrath, because Paul says, 
Through Christ, we have also obtained access to God by faith, Romans 5.2. We often emphasize this sentence so that we are understood. The sentence shows most clearly our whole argument and, when carefully considered, can teach abundantly about the whole matter. It can console good minds. So, it is helpful to have it at hand and in sight, that we may be able to set it against the doctrine of our adversaries. They teach that we come to God not through faith, but through love and merits, without Christ as mediator. This sentence also helps us when we fear, so that we may cheer ourselves and exercise faith. This is also clear. We cannot keep the law without Christ's aid. He himself says, apart from me you can do nothing, John 15, 5. So, before we keep the law, our hearts must be born again through faith. Results of the Adversary's Teaching It is clear why we find faults with the adversary's doctrine about good works rewarded because of God's generosity, meritum condigni. The decision is very easy. First, the adversaries do not even mention faith, that we please God through faith for Christ's sake. Rather, they imagine that good works, worked by the aid of the habit of love, make a righteousness worthy to please God by itself, and also worthy of eternal life. So they have no need of Christ as mediator. What else is this than to transfer Christ's glory to our works? It means we would please God because of our works, not because of Christ. But this robs Christ of the glory of being the mediator. He is the mediator forever, and not merely in the beginning of justification. Paul also says that if one justified in Christ seeks righteousness elsewhere, he affirms that Christ is a minister of sin, Galatians 2.17. That is, he does not fully justify. What the adversaries teach is most silly. They teach that good works merit grace because of God's mercy, de condigno. They mean that after the beginning of justification, if conscience is terrified, which happens, Grace must be sought through a good work and not through faith in Christ. Second, the doctrine of the adversaries leaves consciences in doubt so that they can never be quieted. This is so because the law always accuses us, even in good works, for always the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, Galatians 5.17. How will an unbelieving conscience have peace if it believes that for the sake of one's own work it ought now to please God and not for Christ's sake. What work will it find, what will it trust is worthy of eternal life, if, indeed, hope begins from merits? Against these doubts, Paul says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God. Romans 5.1 We should be firmly convinced that we are granted righteousness and eternal life for Christ's sake. He says about Abraham, In hope he believed against hope. Romans 4.18 Third, how will a conscience know when a work was done by the inclination of this habit of love, so that it is possible to conclude that the work merits grace in a wholly deserving way, de condigno? This is very distinction has been created to dodge the scriptures. It teaches that people merit grace at one time in a merely agreeable way, de congruo, and at another time in a wholly deserving way, de condigno. As we have said above, the intention of the one who works does not matter. Hypocrites, in their security, simply think their works are worthy and that they are regarded righteous. On the other hand, terrified consciences have doubts about all works, and for this reason continually seek other works. For this is what it means to merit in a merely agreeable way, de congruo. It means to doubt and, without faith, to work until despair takes place. In short, all that the adversaries teach about this matter is full of errors and dangers. Fourth. The entire church confesses that eternal life is attained through mercy. Augustine speaks in this way on in On Grace and Free Will. There he speaks about the works of the saints completed after justification. God leads us to eternal life, not by our merits, but according to his mercy. He says in his Confessions, Book 9, Woe to the life of man, however much it may be worthy of praise, if it be judged with mercy removed. And Cyprian, in his treatise on the Lord's Prayer, says this, Lest anyone should flatter himself that he is innocent, and by exalting himself should perish the more deeply, he is instructed and taught that he sins daily, and that he is told to ask forgiveness daily for his sins. But the subject is well known and has very many and clear testimonies in Scripture and in the Church Fathers. 
they all declare with one mouth that, even though we have good works, yet in these very works we need mercy. Faith, looking upon this mercy, cheers and consoles us. The adversaries teach wrongly when they praise, praise merits and add nothing about this faith that takes hold of mercy. For, as we have said before, the promise and faith mutually agree with each other. The promise is grasped only through faith. So we say that the promised mercy agrees with the requirement of faith and cannot be taken hold of without faith. So we justly find fault with the doctrine about wholly deserving merits, since it teaches nothing of justifying faith. It also hides Christ's glory and office as mediator. We should not be regarded as teaching anything new in this matter. The Church Fathers have clearly handed down the doctrine that we need mercy, even in good works. Scripture often teaches the same. Enter not into judgment with your servant, for no one living is righteous before you. Psalm 143, 2. This passage denies absolutely, even to all saints and servants of God, the glory of righteousness, if God does not forgive, but judges and convicts their hearts. For when David boasts in other places about his righteousness, he speaks about his own cause against the persecutors of God's word. He does not speak of his personal purity. He asks that God's cause and glory be defended. Judge me, O Lord, according to my righteousness and according to the integrity that is in me. Psalm 7, 8. Likewise, in Psalm 133, he says that no one can endure God's judgment if God were to mark our sins. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? I become afraid of all my suffering, Job 9.28. If I wash myself with snow and cleanse my hands with lye, yet you will plunge me into a pit, Job 9.30-31. Who can say, I have made my heart pure, I am clean from my sin, Proverbs 20.9. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. 1 John 1, eight. In the Lord's Prayer, the saints ask for the forgiveness of sins. Therefore, even the saints have sins. The innocent shall not be innocent. Numbers 14.18 and compare with Exodus 34.7. For the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. Deuteronomy 4.24. Be silent, all flesh, before the Lord. Zechariah 2.13. All flesh is grass, and all its beauty is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows on it. Isaiah 40, 6-7. Namely, flesh and righteousness of the flesh cannot endure God's judgment. And we will leave off there tonight. We now join in the Apostles' Creed in the Lord's Prayer. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. O Lord Jesus Christ, true King of heaven and earth, you promised to your church that the gates of hell would not prevail against her, and you still cause your word to be preached and your holy sacraments to be administered among us. But ah, O Lord, the sins of your people obscure the majesty of your bride. Your holy vineyard is trampled and your blessed sacrifice stands neglected. Many think themselves strong and despise the life-giving food that you have ordained for your people for the forgiveness of their sins. Pardon all our arrogance, and do not come to us in wrath to remove the lamp of your word from before our eyes. O Lord, we pray you, visit this vine which you once established for yourself, and renew us with the sun of your mercy and the water of eternal life. Give us a great hunger for the food of your true body and blood, and let all your faithful people ever be found in the Apostles' doctrine, in the fellowship, in the breaking of your bread, and in the prayers. 
We implore you, O Lord, for our altar, that it may ever be a place where the medicine of eternal life, the forgiveness of our sins, strengthens us in body and soul, that disbelief and impenitence may stray, stay far from all who come there, so that they may not eat and drink to their own judgment. O eternal High Priest, let the fruit of your Spirit grow in us, which is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, gentleness, and chastity. Cause us to live in holy conduct toward one another to the glory of your holy name, here in time and hereafter in eternity. For you live and reign with the Father and the same Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let your merciful ears, O Lord, be open to the prayers of your humble servants, and that they may obtain their petitions. Make them to ask such things as shall please you, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day, and I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong, and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul in all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good night.